and welcome to the program. Well, this is part two of a two-part series. The guest is Curtis Bowers, the producer of the Agenda production that many of you already have, but if you don't, we encourage you to get a hold of it. We'll say more about that later. It certainly looks at, so what is the agenda? And that's what we spent all last week on. We looked at the Marxist agenda, and as I said to Curtis when we came on air last week, He was with me as a guest over a year ago, May of 2019, and we talked about the communist agenda to take over America, to take over the world. We talked about the globalist system. Little did I think that just over a year later came, well, let's go back to the George Floyd incident, Memorial Day here in my hometown, Minneapolis. That was the spark that lit quite an inferno, and the country has, in a sense, figuratively and literally been on fire since about Memorial Day. And before that, we have and still have the COVID controversy, and I would call it COVID chaos. That caused an economic meltdown in our country. And between the two, and some other issues going on as well, all of January, we had to hear the constant groaning of impeachment, impeachment, impeachment to wear us all down. (laughs) That's been 2020. So last week, we just talked very heavily. How did this happen? This Marxist agenda that was planned about 100 years ago to take down the greatest country in the world. We talked a little bit about the Red-Green Alliance, and particularly in Minnesota, we have what's known as the Red-Green Alliance, communism and Islam working hand in hand. Minnesota has Representative Ilhan Omar, who just recently called for everything being dismantled in America. Her politics, everything, the police, everything should go. Well, what kind of thinking is this? I'll tell you what kind of thinking it is. It's delusional. It's what the Bible calls strong delusion. End time, strong delusion. The Bible also says in Revelation 13, there is coming a global government. It will be headed by the Antichrist. Is the Antichrist going to be a communist? Probably. We don't know. But he'll be a totalitarian. Let's leave it at that. The Antichrist will be some kind of a totalitarian, certainly socialist, very likely communist, and he will rule the world. He will rule it with the barrel of a gun, that's for sure. So we talked about those things. Now, here's where you can pick up part one if you missed it, because I think the two parts are going to play together. You can get it at my website, olivetreeviews.org, and go to radio. You can get it on our YouTube channel where we insert a lot of visual images, including the videos that we're playing. And the YouTube channels under Jan Markell. You can also see it visually at hischannel.com, One Place's Light Source. The audio is at oneplace.com. Encourage you to pick up part one of the program. Part two will make a whole lot more sense if you get the opportunity to play part one. We also talked a little bit about education because they certainly grabbed the minds of the children 100 years ago, but really picked up intensity in the 1960s and going forth. Of course, prayer taken out of school in 1963, and the 60s seemed to be a turning point for a lot of things going haywire. Curtis Bowers, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for having me on again. Curtis, in my summary there, what have I missed that the audience needs to know before we move into part two? That a lot of what is going on is shocking to a lot of us, so they shouldn't feel like they're all alone. It has moved forward at a faster pace than anyone anticipated, even those who have been paying attention to what's been happening. We need to do what Jana is doing. You need to share these shows with people, educating others about what is going on is one of the most important things you can do in this time where we all feel almost helpless. It's as we said, the left has taken over so much from technology to music to education to the media to Hollywood to social media to politics, sports. Curtis, whoever would have thought that the communists could take over sports? It's the furthest thing from my mind. It is unbelievable. But again, they want all the levers of influence. So do sports have any influence in America? Oh, boy, do they. Yes. When I saw pictures of Little League football teams a year or so ago, and they played the national anthem at the Little League, and all the boys are on their knees. And I thought, wow, they know how to get people Mm -hmm. that have influence to be on board with what they're doing. Yes, and how convenient, again, as far as it concerns young people, to be the masters of the universe with social media. Our young people and plenty of adults, they're 
pastime is social media. Well, it's controlled by the extreme left. That's right. And they censor anything that doesn't go along with the party line. And that's what really lets us see how far this is moving, because YouTube and some of those channels, they're just starting to delete anything Mm -hmm. that's not in agreement with the ultra leftist radical position. And we talked about the intense hatred of President Trump. And we talked last week also about what happens if President Trump wins the election in November. Quite frankly, I personally am hoping that's the case. But what will be the fallout? If you think we've seen some, let's just say, agitation here in the last few months in the streets, etc., maybe mild compared to what's going to happen if the president is rewarded with a second term. We don't know that, but when we see the passion behind the leftist agenda, I am concerned that if the president wins the election in November, We have a meltdown if the president loses. Our country's handed over to a Marxist ideology. And I think you said in 100 days, right, Curtis? If they get the House, the Senate, and the presidency, yes, I think in 100 days, they would accomplish more than they have in the last 100 years. And why do you say that? Because the president's been in office three and a half, almost four years. But why do you say in just 100 days, this is going to be lightning fast, this will happen this time? Because they're not playing games anymore. They're not even pretending to be pro-American. They are trying to sink and destroy openly and clearly. So I think the AOCs and all those different people, if Mm -hmm. they really had the majority in the House and the Senate and the presidency, they're going to just implement these things at lightning speed because that's what they want to do. What happens is when you get voted into power, it gives you the illusion that everyone's for you. So you can just do what you said you're going to do. They especially have always fallen to that. They just start moving ahead with their agenda. I think if that were to happen, it would just be the Green New Deals and all those type of things would instantly be put into law, and our life here would change immediately. Biden has already told us, like in charge of gun control, Beto, and he is for total gun control. We know a lot of these things from what they've said openly, the direction they're going, If they have the power next time, I think they're going to use it. They're not going to gradually step through things like even Obama did a little bit. They're going to move forward because they don't want to take a chance of losing control. Interesting. And then you said last week that 90 percent of those on the left in the Democrat Party leadership, 90 percent are Marxists. Bluntly, Trevor Loudon has said the same on this program. I know that's shocking to a lot of my listeners, and I think we need to clarify too, Curtis, We've got some believers listening who choose to vote Democrat. You know, that's your choice, folks. The potential consequences of this can be so grave if, in fact, it's true, and no one's come after you or Trevor Loudon to say, you know what, you're a liar, that 90% of those on the left are now following the Marxist agenda. We talked about that last week. Why don't you back that up right now? Take a minute. If you go to the Communist Manifesto Mm -hmm. and look up the 10 planks of the Communist Manifesto on your computer, you'll look through that list and you'll see that they agree with every single one of those. And they also agree and believe in the fundamentals of Marxism, which is this. It's the belief that the good of the many outweighs the good of the few. That doesn't sound too bad on the surface, but when it's implemented from the top down, It always ends in the abuse of the individual because all they are going for is the good of the many. And, of course, the individual doesn't know what's best for the many. So you have to trust government because how would you know in your little town what's best for the world? So it puts you in a subservient position to just accept whatever they say about the environment or about Mm -hmm. socialism or about how we're going to do economic reforms in the world. It makes you subservient. And as we see over the 20th century, every time. When it was implemented, it abused the very people it was supposed to bless. So that's how we know, because they agree with all the Marxist positions, and therefore that makes you a Marxist, whether you know you're one or not. They might not even know that, but that's who Mm -hmm. they are. I want to deliver here what I promised both last week and kind of going into program two here, and that is, how is this affecting the church? It's affecting the church lots of ways, but one way would be social justice. I'm playing clips, folks, from the product we carry. It's in my store. It's in my newsletters. And it's the Agenda Twin Pack DVD set. And so you're going to get two DVDs that Curtis has produced. He started producing these almost a decade ago. 
And as we said last week, some folks have said to him, how did you know when you started making these films, which, by the way, it's an award-winning film, he nailed everything. He really did. And that's because he studied this, frankly, since he was a kid. We were playing heavily off of the Agenda DVD, the Twin Pack. I'm going to play a clip here because our target this hour is just how is Christianity and your church in the crosshairs? Christianity has always been the main target because they knew with a strong Christian church, their plans of a one world government that requires a one world religion to succeed would never be possible. And I think that's why Christianity is a religion that people intent on despotism don't want around. The surest sign that the elites in our society are up to no good, just as the founders of our country predicted they would be, by the way, is that they're trying to get rid of Christianity. Because Christianity is what encourages people, emboldens people, who live according to good conscience, acknowledging God, to stand firm in the right. Step one was to remove God's word, the absolute authority and standard of the church. It's as if the uncomfortable things that hold us accountable have slowly been scrubbed from the message from the pulpit. What was sin 2,000 years ago is sin today. And that's a message I think we need to hear quite often from the pulpit, and I don't hear it that much. Research shows the majority of Americans don't believe anymore that the Bible is God's Word. But a more amazing testimony to the left's success is the vast majority of seminaries in America don't either. Curtis, explain how and when were the seminaries infected with this communistic message? We know from testimonies given to Congress back in the 1950s when a few of the top communist officials defected away from communism because they started to see it wasn't the right path. They were interviewed before Congress, and a congressman asked them, what have you been doing to take America down from within? And they very eloquently <laughs> state that because of their limited numbers and just the few people they have that are faithful, the number one thing they had been going into to make a difference to take America down was the seminaries mm -hmm. since the 30s. That's why the mainline denominations were taken over back then in the 30s and 40s, because they have a hierarchy. So it's much easier to take over. You just work your way up to those positions, and then you are in control. But then it continued on, and they realized the evangelical church that had sprung up because those churches, the mainline ones, had all fallen away. They didn't have a hierarchy, and so it was much tougher for them. So then in the 50s and primarily really in the 60s, they started going into the evangelical seminaries as fast as they could to get their degrees and then stay on and be the professors so they could teach the pastors. And that is why we have seen the dramatic change in the evangelical church over the last 50 years. Plus the death of discernment, totally gone. It's so far gone. Jan, I think we were talking about yeah. this earlier. I have had the blessing and privilege of traveling all over this country for the last 10 years with my family. We've been in hundreds of churches in 43 different states, and that's the number one thing I was even telling my children after one of our trips. I go, kids, you know what's happened to this country? We have lost discernment. It was rampant in the churches, the pastors, so many places, people didn't seem to have the fundamental discernment to know what's, agree. what's good for their kids or not good for their kids or good for their church or good for their congregation. So we have a crisis because of that. And then we have here in the summer of 2020, what comes along? And it sounds so good because black lives, they really do matter. Of course, all lives matter, I maintain. Then this organization comes along in the summer of 2020 following the tragic death of George Floyd here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. A lot of pastors, a lot of churches said, this sounds good that we honor black people, African Americans. My goodness, haven't they been oppressed? It just seems like a noble cause. What's wrong with this picture, Curtis Bowers? Well, again, they didn't dig in to see, is it really about what they're saying? That's it's right. About? That's the discernment to go, let me look at this on the surface. One thing that should have been a red flag is when you see the destruction going on, you go, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. The fruit of righteousness, the fruit of truth is never revolution, ever. Destruction and destroying, that's never the fruit of a good movement. Right there, they should have said, wait a minute, this is not what it appeared to be. But even the term Black Lives Matter 
is so divisive mm-hmm. because then all the other people groups are like, hey, what about us? And that's what they're doing by coming up with that. The Marxists that came up with that group and that run that group, they wanted to divide the blacks off from us. We don't want that. We want them with us. We want to be unified. We want to be together. We want to be able to love them and go to church with them, be a blessing to them. And they want to divide them off so they can use them. And that's why they're trying everything they can to just fracture us into a million pieces. And the black community just happens to be one of those pieces. And we need to say no. We're not allowing you to solely use people based on the color of their skin. And we need to just be wise enough to love the black people that are around us because they are so confused because of all the lies they've been told. And we need to let them know, no, we love you and we're grateful for you. But we need to stop those that are using them and expose them. Very well said. And again, this has crept into the church. And I think the church sees this as almost a new evangelism. Uh, the new salvation gospel replaced by the overall picture of social justice. We're kind of narrowing that social justice picture down right now to the Black Lives Matter because that has been the emphasis of the long, hot summer of 2020. My hometown wrecked by Black Lives Matter and Antifa. Curtis, what's the difference between Black Lives Matter and Antifa? Not much. They work together. They are like sister organizations The left is very good about working together. So there's about 20 groups working under Antifa, which is an umbrella group. And one of them is Black Lives Matter. One of them is the Revolutionary Abolitionist Movement. They're all working together. And let me just read you a couple of their goals on their website. So you see what these groups are really about. Goal number one, liberation will be won by any means necessary. You see, that's what's going on. Here's goal number two. We will destroy the state, police, military, corporations, and all those who run the American plantation. If you want to know what they're about, that's a Marxist revolution. People that think that's too strong a word, it's not. Number four, systems of punishment will be abolished. There will be no law to enforce, no money to protect. It's going to be communal, which is communism. Number six, there will be no government. No person or group will have power over another. Yeah, a little fairy tale. And when you create that, Here's what you need to understand, people listening. A lot of people go, why do they want chaos? They want chaos, and they want to turn it into the Wild West where there's no law and order, Mm -hmm. and they want to defund the police and stuff, because in chaos, people demand help, and then they will rise up and crack down, because you have to crack down when you have a total lawlessness, and you have to do things totalitarian, and that's why it's about. But it goes on. Number eight was abolish private property. It says, number nine, Alongside international comrades, they're even using the communist term, we will destroy all borders for the free movement of people everywhere. And just on and on. It's all destruction, revolution, and totalitarianism. Uh, Curtis, we're heading for the days of Al Capone. That's right. That's what they want. You have to break everything down where things are so desperate they can put up their puppet. If you haven't studied the 20th century, this is what they did in 50-plus countries Mm -hmm. from 1917 to 1980. They stirred the people up. They got it where there was chaos and violence and revolution. And then they put their man up who was for the people and for justice. He gets voted into power. A lot of people don't know that. Most of the countries the Soviet Union took over in the 20th century, their leader was voted into power. They didn't take over with tanks. They took over with a movement exactly like what we have in America today. Would Venezuela be a good example? Yes, Venezuela is exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. They come in, they pillage your country where there's nothing left, then the tanks do roll out. Then they roll out. It's never worked. And so when we allow them to teach our children and others that that's what we're shooting for, it's utter foolishness. And we really have our job cut out for us. I want to play a little clip here. It's very short. That helps explain a little bit. This is social justice, because again, the purpose of this hour is to go ahead first into figuring out how did this enter the church? The National Council of Churches, World Council of Churches turned left so long ago. Matter of fact, the National Association of Evangelicals, my understanding is, came along in the 1940s to counter the National Council of Churches. Then the National Association of Evangelicals has taken a left turn. Here, starting in the 90s and even more so in the 2000s, terrible left turn. We don't have time to go into that, but our point is every denomination, every theological stream today 
is being affected by this leftist agenda. The main thing they're using is, because it sounds so good, social justice. For instance, real briefly here, the Palestinian cause. Aren't the Palestinians poor and downtrodden, and aren't the Israelis beating them up? No, but that's the narration that's out there, is that we have to be with the Palestinians we have to stand for justice, social justice, because the Israelis are the bad guys. No, the Israelis have made the Palestinian life pretty good in the Middle East, one of the best in the Middle East. Here's just a little description about social justice. And then as we move into the second half of my programming this weekend, we're going to take a very serious look, yeah, and a deeper look at the social justice effort in our churches. The Lord is a God of social justice. That's the message in many, maybe most, churches and synagogues in America and the West today. But here's the problem. The Bible doesn't actually say that. It says in Isaiah, the Lord is a God of justice. You'll find a lot of references to justice in the Bible, but you'll never find it preceded by the word social. But you're probably thinking, what's the difference? Isn't God the God of justice and social justice? Well, not if he's consistent. You see, God cannot be the God of justice and social justice because social justice is not just. Justice is getting what you deserve without favor. Social justice is getting what you don't deserve because you are favored. Justice is blind. Social justice is not. Let's say a man robs a store. Justice demands but one thing that he be tried in a court of justice and, if he is found guilty, punished. That is not how social justice works. Social justice doesn't only ask if the person is guilty. It asks about his economic condition. Is he poor or wealthy? About his upbringing. What kind of childhood did he have? About his race or ethnicity. Is he a member of a group that has been historically oppressed? Justice demands that everyone be equal under the law. Social justice demands that everyone be equal, period. Economically, socially, and in every other possible way. Justice asks, who did it? Social justice asks, why did he do it? Curtis Bowers, somehow the weapon of social justice, as you write, has become the world's salvation gospel. I don't know how it happened, but it did. Yes, he who defines the terms wins the argument. And that's what's happened on so many fronts. They have defined what things mean, but they've not used the correct dictionary definitions. They have modified them, and it's a very powerful weapon against us. Social justice was started by the Marxist as a way of hijacking the church. They knew they needed a special movement that would use Christian terminology that would sound very Christian and biblical and even throw Jesus into the mix if necessary to get them to be working at these do-gooder social gospel type things. Even Dr. Walter Rosenbush, who started the social justice gospel back in the late 1800s, he very interestingly enough was a member of the Fabian Socialist yes, Society, uh -huh. which what was their goal? To socialize the world. The goal was socialism. And that's what he laid the foundation for that they're going on today of turning the church as an instrument to promote socialism instead of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, right. which gives everyone hope and everyone. It's just amazing how they do these things. Well, it's like you say, churches are losing their young people, many of them anyway, and they're susceptible to being swallowed up by radical groups if they want a cause, and young people certainly want a cause. And again, Black Lives Matter sounds like such a noble cause. Then we get back to pastors not preaching messages that are going to keep young people in the church because they're not preaching messages that help us cope with our times. Not all pastors. And thank you to you pastors who are holding to truth. And we really, really are so thankful that some of you are out there. I hear from some of you, and I love it when I do. If you'd like to learn more or reach out to Curtis, do so at agendadocumentary.com, agendadocumentary.com. If you'd like the two-DVD set, Agenda Twin Pack, this is a wonderful, well, nearly a college course on how did this terrible dogma of Marxism in the last 100 years make the impact it has, and particularly in America. And Curtis's emphasis is, is what it's done to America in the last 100 years. 
and then we've seen it play out on our streets here in the infamous summer of 2020. When I come back, we're going to continue with the churches are pushing socialism. How did it happen? And we said in last week's programming, you can find it on my website, on our YouTube channel, the seminaries got infiltrated in the 1930s, and sort of the rest is history. So who's promoting it today? Well, I'm going to tell you right up front, those who are friendly to it include the Southern Baptist Convention, the Gospel Coalition. I could go on, name all sorts of organizations that are friendly to the social justice and even socialism. So we'll talk more about that. Please don't go away. I'm coming right back. Think about this. Islam doesn't believe in women's rights. It's fine for a husband to beat his wife. There's no freedom of speech. Any who disagree are executed. Homosexuals are stoned to death. Pornography and alcohol are punished with a beating. And yet the left loves their system, one that stands against everything they claim to support. I think this proves beyond a shadow of a doubt the left will support anything and use any people group if they think it will help destroy their two greatest enemies, Christianity and freedom. They no more care about Muslims, the poor, women, blacks, the environment, or the children than they do about an unborn baby's right to life, a Christian's right to free speech, or a balanced budget. It is all a lie. And welcome back. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. Jan Markell, so pleased to have on the line Curtis Bowers, producer of the Agenda Presentation DVD. And we'll say more about that here in the next few minutes as we're winding down our program. Remember, we're very active on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. We post our programming on YouTube where you can see, and we've played clips the last two weeks. This is part two of a two-part series. Lots of clips, almost a dozen. You can see them if you access the programming on our YouTube channel under Jan Markell at his channel, LightSource under OnePlace.com. You can just listen to the program at any time at your convenience, any of those locations, including our website, Olive Tree Views, views as in viewpoint, olivetreeviews.org. We have a very active store. We've got three dozen products that will help you understand the times, contend for the faith, and just plain grow in your faith. And if you're a regular listener and you send us a gift, always tell us how you listen, won't you? It helps me, for one thing, decide if I should remain on certain radio outlets. We're winding down two weeks with Curtis Bowers, and you can learn more at agendadocumentary.com. Curtis and I have been talking during the break because we want to end this two-part series in a real good way. As I introduced the program about half an hour ago, I said the focus of this hour is the church. What has gone haywire in the church to allow the social justice movement to totally invade, not just invade, but nearly take over? And I'm not just talking about the first congregational church or disciples of Christ, some of these denominations that are far left to begin with, but I'm talking about now some evangelical churches. And I mentioned Southern Baptist Convention. We're going to talk about it for just a few minutes. Let me just read to you. This goes back to a little more liberal here, but I picked this up off of Prophecy News Watch. Let me just read two short paragraphs. This past summer, the ELCA Convention passed an interfaith resolution stating that we do not know what God thinks of non-Christian religions. A delegate got the microphone to offer an amendment saying that we do know because of John 14, 6, which says that Jesus is the only way of salvation. His amendment was voted down by 97%. A Chicago newspaper asked ELCA head bishop Elizabeth Eaton if hell exists, and her response, well, it may, but I think it's empty. Then the article goes on to say, Recently, the Christian Post reported on the ELCA promoting a prayer to Mother God. If you go to herchurch.org, you will find an ELCA congregation in California, which worships our mother who is within us. ELCA's Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, one half hour from me here, held a commemoration service for Transgender Day in remembrance in which the transgender preacher led the students in the Lord's Prayer saying, Our Mother in Heaven. So a lot of churches are pushing aberration, they're pushing socialism, they're pushing absolute 
heresy. And we also talked about earlier in this segment, and we referred to it in program number one, part of this that's happened in the church, and of course the Bible prophesies this, two things the Bible talks about more than anything. Number one, the rebirth of Israel, and number two, the great falling away or the great apostasy and the death of discernment. People won't even be able to tell that a wolf is slinking around amidst the flock, and that's what's going on today. And so as a result, the other issues that have slipped in would be more of the political issue, and that's sort of our focus here for the last two weeks. Curtis, I just gave about a five-minute spiel there. You pick up on what I just said. The reason all of what you just said is happening is because the church has been hijacked. That's what people need to understand. Lenin himself, the founder of the Soviet Union, said, the best way to control the opposition is to lead it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Their strategy is always you infiltrate the enemy from the inside, subvert it from the inside, and change it and use it. Goal 27 from the communist goals from the 50s said, infiltrate the churches and replace revealed religion with social Mm -hmm. religion Mm -hmm. and discredit the Bible. It's not an accident these things are happening. No, I think there's a lot of lost people leading a lot of churches, and they're using that as a means of power and control and influence. The church is the most influential organization in the world. Nothing touches the church, and they know that. And that's why 100 years ago, hey, we got to take that over. We got to start infiltrating and subverting from the inside. We're just seeing the fruit of 100 years of hard work coming to flourish and right in front of us. So that's what it is. When you see it, we can't be so naive to go, well, he's just well-meaning and he's misguided. He might be misguided, and maybe he's well-meaning, but you have to get out of that church. You cannot be in a church where that pastor for sure isn't born again and for sure isn't preaching Genesis to Revelation with no apologies, no explanations, because God's Word is God's Word. This is about changing God's Word and redirecting all the energies of the church into social movements to accomplish their goals, these people that hate the church. Something I came across, and I've actually done radio on it, it would have been many months ago now. We began our discussion with the social unrest in America, their cities being attacked literally, some of them having huge destruction. Behind all of that, generally communist outfits, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, Communist Party USA, Democrat Socialists of America. There's so many of them. There's probably 20 groups. Most prominent would be Antifa, Black Lives Matter, some Soros-backed groups. I came across in some of my study here this critical race theory, and I don't want to dwell on it, but I want to get it out there because critical race theory, we're back to the racial issues. Critical race theory is going to suggest that whites are at the top of the privileged mountain. Blacks are below whites. Lesbians and transgenders, they're beneath whites. And we need to be catering to all of these who might be in a minority category. But that the Southern Baptist Convention has so bought into critical race theory. There are a number of clips I could have picked off in the internet and played. I actually did that some six months ago. There are professors at Southern Baptist Seminary who are pushing critical race theory. And then you personally, Curtis, have some issues with J.D. Greer. But first, I want you to respond to this critical race theory, because again, they're playing on the issue of race, which seems to be the new sacred cow. I think 10 years ago, it was global warming, but now it seems to be race. It's always something to divide and conquer, whatever it is. Divide the homosexuals off, divide the transgender off, divide the black people off, divide and conquer, where they make people so fixated on this one aspect of their life instead of the fact that, hey, all of us live in this wonderful country and about 90% of the things we agree on. We appreciate being free and we appreciate a lot of things. They don't want us to see any common ground between us. It's just another very strategic, intellectual-sounding movement to divide Mm. groups off each other so they can turn them against each other and cause more chaos, cause more destruction. Like the little phrase from the 60s, the issue is never the issue. Mm -hmm. The issue is always the revolution. Everything they're doing is about the revolution. It has nothing to do with the issue. It has nothing to do with the climate or black lives 
or the homosexual movement. They could care less about all those people groups and all those things, but they will use anything to their advantage so they can have a revolution. And we are just seeing that unfold. Did you want to comment about any of the leadership then? Well, it should be a sign to all of us. When we have pastors and some of the leaders, and I'm not specifically wanting to just pick on J.D. Greer, but I was watching some videos of Mm -hmm. him speaking at a church, and I realized, wait, 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 this man is in love with the culture. His hair was all messed up. He hadn't shaven. His shirt's all messed up and wrinkly and untucked. And I'm like, this is the head of the largest conservative denomination of churches, 35,000 churches or whatever. And he is so disrespectful of that position, he's just trying to look like a teenager, and he's not a teenager. It made me think instantly of Trump. How is he always dressed? In a suit. Why? Because he has respect for the office office that he holds. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan, they said, would not even take his coat off in the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. Even if he was in there 20 hours, he would not take it off. He said that it's disrespectful of this office. Where we're seeing little symptoms and signs of someone that's so concerned of looks instead of truth or fitting in instead of standing up. When you see that, that should be a red flag. Wait, wait, what's going on here? Who have they voted in as the head of this thing when he seems to have a different agenda? And there may be several within Southern Baptist Convention that agree with you and have some questions as well. I have had serious issues with Russell Moore over the years. Mr. Moore has been an ardent Democrat all of his life, and he seems to champion a lot of the leftist causes. I'm just concerned because I have a lot of listeners in the Southern Baptist Convention. They love the Lord. They're solid as a rock, and they just see changes happening before their eyes. Look, I've reported on the Evangelical Free Church in that they gave up the premillennial return of Jesus Christ and inserted the glorious return. Taking away premillennialism, it's a huge thing to be removing, folks, because it opens the door for apostasy. So I'm trying to be an equal opportunity offender here and not just pick on certain denominations. You know, I can reference some things going on in the Assemblies of God, too, and I have wonderful AG listeners. I hear from them all the time. The things that are going on are leaving no denomination behind. It's all we're saying. You want to take a look at some of the things going on in your church and find out the positions that the leadership is taking. Would I be right there, Curtis? Yes, and we're not at all saying all Southern Baptists are no good. If you're in a good one, you keep it good. You get there and hope to have accountability and get to know that pastor and make sure if you're getting a new pastor, you know what you're getting. And if it goes so far that the ship is sinking, then become an independent church or whatever. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be dependent on that denomination is what I'm saying. And if you love the Lord, make sure you're in a church that is loving him by speaking all of his truth. And if you are, thank the Lord for that and keep moving forward. But if you're not, you cannot sit there and reward a pastor. I don't care if you've been there 30 years, reward a pastor with your tithes and your presence when he is not doing what God has asked him to do as a shepherd of God's sheep. You need to really think about that. I've been talking to Curtis Bowers here for two weekends as we look at some of the issues of the day as we see our cities and towns and states being literally attacked. We carry his DVD agenda, and you can get that in my store, the Twin Pack, and it talks about when this happened, why this happened, how it's happening, who the major players are. What I'm getting some emails from folks saying, my pastor got behind the pulpit this past Sunday and praised for 40 minutes Black Lives Matter. This is an evangelical church, and I'm hearing from evangelicals out there that the pastors are getting up and saying, well, we got to support this movement. In one church, he had all the African-Americans stand. I mean, that's fine. There are many in the congregation that were so uncomfortable with what was going on here. I'm not suggesting that that church has been infiltrated by the Marxist agenda. It may be. What would you say, Curtis? A lot of times it is, and again, it might be a well-meaning guy well that's bought into this stuff. Here's the thing. We don't push things that are using black people. If you want to have an outreach to the black community in your community, that's wonderful. And you do things and be a blessing to them, but that's real people. We're acting like they almost get separated out from being human beings and individuals. This thing divides them off. They are just like us. They are. And they need love. They need respect. They need a friend, and they need a Christian there praying for them. This causes so much division, even the talk of it. We shouldn't be looking at people based on their skin color. 
We should be loving everyone Amen. and being kind and considerate and sharing the gospel with everyone and speaking the truth to them. We just seem to be caught up in all this nonsense that's not accomplishing what it says it's going to accomplish. And I think this is what was making these folks so uncomfortable, those who are writing me saying this is what happened in our pulpit, is what they register with what you're saying. They just could not make it compute when the pastor got up and singled out everyone who was African-American when my listeners agree with what you just said. Let me quote you here, because you've written extensively here on social justice, and you say this, social justice is simply the left using Christian terminology to sell socialism to the church. They can manipulate churchgoers into voting for radical leftists, promising to help the poor with more government programs. Those programs, of course, only enslave people in dependency and guarantee a leftist votes. And then you say, so now loving your neighbor really means tolerating your neighbor, and tolerance means accepting them just the way they are. To tell them they are sinners in the need of a savior is hateful and therefore can no longer be done. This, of course, eliminates the sharing of the gospel and stops us from doing the most loving thing we can, telling them the truth, the good news. That is what is so evil. Socialism wants to make sure everything is fair and equal. So to pull the sinner up, you have to ignore their sin. Two more sentences here. You say, and you can't have moral standards in anything, because by doing that, you are suggesting that everybody's way of doing things isn't equal. Well, that's hateful. And slowly you lose all standards and everything, and that is what's happening today. You conclude, share the good news of the gospel. Socialism eliminates repentance because nothing is sin. Everything is the result of things not being fair. So the churches are full of lost people. Very well said, Curtis, as we try to analyze what is this social justice emphasis? How has it happened? Just what is it all about? And what is the wreckage? The wreckage is people having a false sense of security by thinking fighting for these causes is what Christianity is all about instead of being born again. The one area we're all equal is we all equally fall short of mm -hmm. the glory of God. That's right. And that's what we need to build on. I don't care if you're rich, poor, if you have fallen short of the glory of God, you have broken his commandments and you are guilty and you deserve punishment. And the wonderful news is that we should be sharing instead of this nonsense is, guess what? A Savior came to die and shed his blood for your sins so you can be free of having to pay that penalty by going to hell. That's some good news for everyone. If you're poor, if you're rich, no matter who you are, black, white, yellow, it doesn't matter. God died on the cross, and that's the focus of the church is to live in such a way that he looks good when we share the gospel with him because we are loving, we are kind, but to share that message. And when you don't share the message and you just give the guy the food and you don't tell mm -hmm. him you gave it to him because you love Jesus, you are doing that out of pride to look good or feel good, and that itself is sin. And this whole social justice movement is sinful because it's making us look good or feel good instead of Jesus looking good. You say the social justice movement, which is Marxist, is taking down the evangelical church. So we need to be aware of it and understand it. It's a deadly lie that is corrupting the mission of the church and the true gospel. It's becoming their religion and it is a false religion. You and I both speak out very strongly against this social justice movement. As we're saying this, Curtis, we're making some who are listening extremely agitated, extremely angry, to be honest, because I guess maybe they've drunk the Kool-Aid and they think this is the cause of the 21st century, at least in the church. Those of you that might feel that way that are listening, the reason you might feel that way is because you've been told something different, and so it's a conflict of interest type of thing. The only reason we are saying that is, like we stated earlier, John 14, 6 yes. says, and Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's a reality whether you like it or not. And the social justice movement says, no, no, good works get you there. And loving your neighbor gets you there. Those are all fine things to do if you're doing them out of a love for the Savior. But if you're doing them so you can reject a Savior that has died for you, then they are prideful and sinful and will wind up sending you to hell. It's frustrating because the only reason we speak truth, the only reason Jan's speaking the truth and I'm speaking the truth is because we love you. And we are commanded by God to share that good news to every creature. 
And that's what we're trying to do. And sometimes it's hard to swallow when Mm -hmm. you've been told something different, but you need to prayerfully consider what is being said. I believe it was the first program I read an email. I'm not going to read it again. Just summarize because I get so many that say things similar. This one happened to be from Maria, and she had heard the Michelle Bachman program, which now is perhaps even a month ago. That program was about the plight of America. My goodness, what's happened to our country in half a year? It's almost unrecognizable. Parts of it are destroyed probably for many years. This Maria said, what on earth can we do? And she thought, well, I'll go to my pastor. And then she said, you know what? No, my pastor's not going to get it. He's probably in the category that we've just talked about here for the last few minutes. And so she appealed to me, what can we do? So we talked a little bit about that in program number one. We're going to close this program. We're going to review a few things and add a few things. One of the things you can do, folks, you can get this DVD set. In about 90 minutes, you'll get the agenda outlined before you and what you can do. Find it in my store. Again, I'm not trying to make a sale. I could care less about making sales here. I do care that you get information and be equipped. Get it in my store, olivetreeviews.org, or get my newsletters, or call my office, Central Time, and we'll get that out to you. So that's one thing you can do. That's probably the easiest thing. You don't have to leave your living room to get educated on it. Curtis, you take it here. We can pray, obviously. What else? As we see, like you said, the last six months has shown us we are vulnerable to many different type things. The pandemic, natural disasters, the riots. There's so many things going on. I really would encourage you to be more prepared at home. I'm encouraging my friends and family, and we normally haven't done this, to have maybe two months of food, medicines, and other supplies just there at home. If nothing else, you can use them to be a blessing to others if you need to. But just in case things go really south here, which they could, right. what we're talking about here, if it's not connecting with you, America is changing dramatically. And you need to be prepared. And that's one just basic way to be prepared. So if something was happening in your area really bad, you could stay at home for a month or two and be totally fine, which would give you time to think and to pray and decide what's the best thing for us to do. So that's just a key common sense thing with what we've seen happen. A second thing, like you were saying, be prayerful. The Bible tells us that hard times are coming, so we shouldn't be surprised when they do. We instead should be prayerfully asking God for clear direction, which he promises to do. He says, I will direct your path if you're acknowledging me in all that you do. That's a real serious part of our life. It should be. Lastly, we need to be separate. This can look a lot of different ways to a lot of different people. But one of the things I would encourage you just to think about, if you live in one of the big ultra-liberal cities or states, consider and see if it's possible, and it might not be, consider moving to a more conservative city or state so that your money and your creativity and your business and your influence is blessing and building that city or state up instead of propping up the liberal cities that are destroying themselves. One thing we've learned over the last month or so from the Seattle situation with the Mm -hmm. CHOP zone. This is what we learned, and it's key. If you leave liberals to themselves, they will self-destruct. If you leave the radical, progressive Marxists, they will self-destruct because they do not have the tools of character and virtue and morality to be able to sustain freedom and liberty and life. You don't want to be around them when they are self-destructing. The Bible even says, the companion of fools shall be destroyed. Not that it makes you a companion to them, but you know what I mean. If you're in those areas, Mm -hmm. just think about that and pray about that. See if God would open an opportunity where you could do that. Because I think what's going on, this battle is not ending. I hope that was clear. It's Mm -hmm. probably going to accelerate if Trump's reelected or if he's not reelected. Yes, I think that's a good reminder. So we just need to be really talking as a family, as couples, about plan B for what do we do if this happens? What do we do with that? Mm -hmm. Just be prepared like we should be anyway. A Christian should never be caught off guard because we need to be the ones that are calm and peaceful in the midst of chaos so we can share that gospel and so we can be a blessing to those around us. Curtis, I think you're called for such a time as this. Certainly your product is for such a time as this. Now, are you continuing to travel and visit churches? Yes, we are doing that on and off, and they can contact me at our website if they're interested in maybe setting something up. I highly recommend that, by the way. I've seen Curtis maneuver in the church, and he's very, very effective. That's agendadocumentary.com, right? That's right. If you want to contact him and have him come to your church, 
I think it'd be a very informative time for your church. We'd be talking about some of the things we've talked about here in the last two weeks. I want to thank you for what you do, Curtis, so much. We're down to 30 seconds. If you have a parting thought, it's all yours. Well, I also, just to stay informed of what's going on, I've got that Faith, Family, and Freedom yes. with Curtis Powers podcast that Excellent. will keep bringing you current information about our situation. Faith, Family, and Freedom with Curtis Bowers. It's a podcast. Go to agendadocumentary.com, or is there an yes. easier way? You can go there and get it as well, yes. It's excellent. I've heard it. It's three, four times a month. I drew some information for these broadcasts from the podcast, so it's excellent. We've talked about some heavy things the last two weeks. Matter of fact, some of it's a little bit on the dark side and more inconvenient truth. And that is why we must end with a look at what Scripture says about the turmoil of our time. It says in Psalm 2, Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Always remember that when it comes to evil men who plot and scheme, God sits in the heavens and laughs at them, and God will have the final say. I want to thank you.